So I guess, uh, I guess when you had started then, uh, uh, what was the uh, culture like there at Marvel? And then I guess, you know, as you went to work for DC as well, how did that corporate uh, culture kind of differ between Marvel and DC? Oh, in the old days, there was a big difference. When I started at Marvel, it was almost like a little family run business. Um, it was very small. Um, Stan's office was like just uh, around the corner down the hall from where I was working. John Vermita's office was 10 feet away. Um, Marie Severin was there down the hall, but there was like, what, 10 people around, 10 or 15 people, and that, that was the Marvel office, you know, and you could come and go as you pleased, um, hang around all day and, and just uh, talk to the editors or your friends or whatever. Um, artists would come and go. It was very friendly, open atmosphere. And then you go up to DC at that time and it was much more corporate, mm -hmm. um, kind of a cooler atmosphere, uh, not as friendly and welcoming. Um, a lot of the editors and artists there were older, uh, where there seemed to be more younger people at, at Marvel. Um, and, but then over the years, there was a lot of cross-pollination. So, uh, a lot of editors and writers and artists went from Marvel to jobs at DC and vice versa. And for a while, DC was the cool place to be and Marvel was a little more um, corporate at times. So it's changed over the decades back and forth um, quite a bit. Hmm. So, uh, so now do you think that was, um, you know, just due to, um, you know, kind of DC being like the key player earlier on and then Marvel kind of gaining that momentum in the sixties and seventies. And then, uh, I mean, I mean, it probably wasn't until uh, crisis at infinite earth that, you know, DC kind of started to come back and become more relevant because there was a, uh, there was a time there when just Marvel was just on fire. And I mean, you know, granted that it kind of fluctuates back and forth between the two, but uh, did you notice a, a specific change in those cultures as kind of the decades went on? Yeah, it was because, um, you know, when DC saw Marvel having such uh, success, they approached the writers and artists at Marvel and say, hey, why don't you come work for us? Trying to steal them away, you know, and um, get some of that magic. And um, some of them did go over and talk to the uh, old timers at DC and said, hey, you know, you need to start doing this that they're doing at Marvel. And uh, it's a younger audience now. And uh, they're interested in, in this kind of storyline where the heroes actually have problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and so DC started imitating Marvel to a degree and then coming up with their own ideas. And then Marvel would see what DC was doing and try to steal artists from them, you know? So there was, it was a lot of competition, uh, a lot of it friendly, some of it not so friendly. Um, you know, they had a couple crossovers where uh, Marvel and DC were co-publishers with Spider-Man and Superman. Um, for some comics and, and things like that. So it's, it's just people looking for work and, and trying to uh, do good stuff and make money and, and be popular. And, um, you know, they fed off each other. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's uh, just in the nature of competition, right, is that, uh, you know, the art tends to stagnate when that competition isn't there. And, uh, you know, when you have a good competitor, you know, it just pushes you to kind of bring out um, that, uh, the, that more of that quality work, right? So I guess, let me ask you when it comes to, you know, I guess your personal opinion um, versus like the, you know, more like open, like a smaller family style and the more corporate environment, which uh, one do you think is more conducive to, um, more conducive to creativity in your mind? I mean, for, for creative business, I think it's better to have a, a, a friendlier atmosphere uh, where you're not uh, worried about um, having to do something you don't want to do, where you have more artistic freedom. Um, so the Marvel method of uh, drawing from a plot, for instance, allows the artist to contribute to this visual storytelling and decide 
how many panels to put on a page and when to start the next page and um, what camera angles to use and all that as opposed to a finished script, which was more often done at DC, uh, telling the artist exactly how many panels and exactly where to put a close up and where to put a long shot, all that kind of stuff um, right. is a little more stifling and uh, prohibiting. So it's, I think it's better to, the more freedom you have as, as a creator, um, I think the work's gonna usually benefit from that. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you on that one because um, I know creativity, um, you know, comes from like a place that's in the moment, you know what I mean? And a lot of those decisions that you make as an artist just come from that kind of gut feeling. Um, so I guess, let me ask you, so you, you'd started off as an inker and you said it would have been um, about five years before you actually got into penciling. So in that time, uh, was there a, a, a couple of different series that you worked on before you were able to get into penciling? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was becoming a really busy inker in the late seventies. Um, I worked on uh, God, what did I do before I started Pinsley? I did a lot of fill-ins, um, Spider-Man fill-ins, and uh, geez, it's so long ago. <laughs> I was inking uh, The Defenders. I was inking Son of Satan. I, did, I was inking over Sal Buscema a lot. Um, I was inking a little over John Buscema, um, Val Mayerick on Frankenstein. Um, Again, jumping around quite a bit. So I worked on a lot of different characters with a lot of different pencilers. I didn't stay on one series, usually very long at all in those days, um, really all through my career, but especially early on, I was just jumping all over the place. Oh, wow. So it sounds like they just kind of had you as the utility player in the office. Yeah, I mean, at the time, um, uh, there would there would be certain artists that would just stay on a book for a decade, you know. Um, the same artists would be drawing Fantastic Four and inking for 10, 15 years. Whereas um, around the time that I came in and, and definitely following me, um, that started to change and uh, they started rotating art teams and, and having you move around a lot more. And part of that was the artist's choice. There was so much, uh, so many different books that everybody wanted to work on um, that they didn't want to stay on one book all the time. Um, and then part editorial sometimes just wanted to change, a little of both. I mean, that seems like it's a good way to keep it fresh though too, you know what I mean? So, you know, people just don't get, um, I don't know, like trapped in the motions of just doing, you know, uh, one character day in day out one story day in day out um you know being able to switch it up you can because like there's a a heck of a world of a difference between um drawing spider-man and drawing the hulk right you know if you've been drawing the hulk for you know over a year you know you kind of uh you know you you, you kind of got those kind of action splash pages down and those different kinds of like panels down but with spider-man man, there's so many different angles and ways that you can contort the body and change it up. So, I mean, I don't know, do you think that uh, benefited the art in general? You know, some artists are less flexible. They might be really good on one type of character and not that good on another type of character. Um, so some artists didn't like, you know, doing, say those are two good examples. The Hulk and Spider-Man are very different. You can be a very good Hulk artist yeah. and just not quite get Spider-Man, you know, not quite feel comfortable putting him in those positions. Um, I think John Buscema was the top artist at Marvel uh, in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. And um, he was so good on so many way in so many ways on so many different characters. I don't think Spider-Man was his best character. And then uh, some of the Spider-Man artists uh, were so good on him, but not so good on some of the other characters. I tried to draw each character differently and, and try to determine what was fun and interesting about that character and try to put that into my drawings. Um, 
I think it helped me to be more of a cartoonist than a, uh, a standard comic book artist because it made me a little more flexible. Yeah, I feel like being flexible is, uh, I mean, th th that's got to be the key, right, to uh, having longevity in that kind of a business, particularly as an artist. So let me ask you, um, after you had, uh, you know, finally gotten into penciling, what were some of the first uh, few titles that you worked on? And uh, was there any particular uh, title or character as a penciler that you just really, you know, kind of vibed with and kind of fed off of? Yeah, when I started penciling, my very first pencil uh, job in the superhero comics was Spider-Man and the Guardians of the Galaxy and Marvel Team-Up. And after that, um, I seemed to do a lot of Spider-Man fill-ins. So he, I enjoyed drawing Spider-Man, and I guess they liked what I was doing on Spider-Man. I did some others, I'm sure, but those are the ones that come to mind. Um, with my penciling and then uh, finally got a shot at doing the X-Men. I, I did a couple of fill-in issues on the X-Men and that's what gave them, uh, got them to offer me the new mutants was they liked what I did on the X-Men. Yeah, now uh, mutants, new mutants. Really, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say new mutants was really my first penciling series. Okay, okay. So the, just that consistency with, the, you know, being the penciler for a series, right? Yeah, it's very different. Um, especially with the New Mutants, I was a co-creator. So I was determining what those characters look like. And uh, they, I created them exactly the way I wanted them. And then it was up to me to keep them looking that way all the time from, like you say, from every angle and um, pose and, uh, they, I wanted them to look like uh, young kids uh, who just were average people who happened to become superheroes, not at especially attractive people like Superman and Wonder Woman. So um, it was fun for me trying to um, make them individuals where some other comic artists uh, like doing that uh, basic stereotype uh, superhero face and then he just changed the hair color to make it look like a different character or whatever um it, you know every artist is a little different yeah i mean well i mean new mutants is uh, you know probably the title that uh, you know kind of rings out the most for you now let me ask you what was the uh, creative process like working with uh, chris claremont on that was he uh was he open to suggestions did you guys uh, kind of uh you know work with each other well yeah, Chris is very good about being open and, and uh, listening to suggestions and, and ideas. He's got so many ideas bursting out of him all the time. Um, he's so creative, uh, but he's very open to your creativity as well. So we had a lot of phone conversations. Uh, most of the time I was living in Tampa and he was in New York while we were working on the book. Um, but I flew up to New York occasionally and um, we would talk in person um, but we, we discussed a lot back and forth. Uh, it was a good collaboration, I thought. Awesome. So let me ask you, did you, uh, on that first visit up, did you get a shirt from him? Because I know his wife likes to make all those shirts. No, I did not. What kind of shirts did, did she make? Oh, she, uh, from what I understand, uh, she just makes these kind of like wild button ups with like all sorts of different kinds of like zany fabrics. And uh, I, don't know, I just uh, heard it was something that uh, uh, Chris would always give to people, you know, he'd have his wife make him a shirt kind of just like a, a hollow present, though that could have been something that was uh, that that they started doing like later on in life. Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I was down in, in Florida, so maybe he never really got the opportunity to, to do that with me. Uh, so uh, so when you were working with uh, Chris on the New Mutants and, uh, you know, you and I mean, New Mutants, you know, it's one of those comic series that just kind of like, um, 
it kind of like hit the nail on the head as far as like youth culture was at the time, which is why I think, um, you know, it was so uh, prevalent. So many people kind of resonated with it because, you know, I mean, similar to what the X-Men did, you know, kind of finding what was important to youth culture in the sixties, new mutants was able to do uh, in the eighties and nineties. Um, so what do you think it was about the new mutants that made that series so successful? Well, from what I've been told, um, the fans really liked the fact that um, they could identify with the characters as teenagers. They liked the fact that they were young teenagers instead of adults. Um, they liked the fact that there was some diversity among the team and they just weren't uh, five white guys. Um, they, they liked the fact that at that time, you know, they were, they were different from uh, the other comics around. You know, the whole thing with Marvel is they kept coming up with something a little different. You know, when Spider-Man came out, there were no other insect characters around, you know. <laughs> when the Hulk came out, there were another big, there were no other big gigantic bruisers like them around. Um, so Marvel managed to keep coming up with these things that were new in a sense in one way or another. Um, and with the new mutants, it was it was that uh, the young characters um, that they could uh, picture themselves being, I guess. Yeah, and I guess, uh, well, I guess that's, uh, you know, really what made like Spider-Man and the original X-Men series stand out so much as well is that, you know, it kind of, um, it kind of gave uh, kids someone to identify with. I mean, you know, similar, I guess, to what we were talking about with Black Panther and minority communities as well. Um, so I guess, uh, let me ask you just because, um, you worked on one of my all-time favorite Spider-Man stories of all time, Craven's Last Hunt. So let me ask you, what was that creative process like? Did uh, did you uh, did you have the ability to kind of you know add your own flavor to that? And uh, you know, as far as uh, storytelling and you know how the different panels were laid out. Yeah, that was a very interesting job. Um, it was it was terrific because it was going over all three Spider-Man titles at the time. So we knew it was going to be a, a special deal. Um, and Mike Zeck and I were friends and I had inked him several times on other projects. Um, so I was comfortable inking his pencils. But those, well, he started out doing incredibly tight pencils uh, for him, um, very detailed. And uh, I was mostly just trying to um, clean it up. You know, pen pencils, again, aren't meant to be traced. So there's a lot involved in inking even when pencils are tight, just uh, making it look as good as I could. And I, I'm more, my anatomy is a little more realistic than Mike. So I would tend to adjust his anatomy more to my thinking as I was inking uh, a little bit, but then kind of midway through that series, Mike, uh, I think got busy on other things as well. And uh, for deadline purposes, he switched over to penciling breakdowns which are more bare bones with no lighting and rendering, just basic storytelling, um, which allowed me to mm -hmm. take over and decide what to do with the lighting and uh, really uh, contribute more to finishing up the drawing. Um, so the last three uh, issues are a, a lot more my contribution than the first three, uh, but I tried to keep it kind of looking consistent throughout at the same time. Yeah, and, and I could see the consistency being hard on that book too, lighting wise, just because, you know, you got the scenes like the different like lightning flashes. And uh, did you run into, um, it, was it uh, hard kind of keeping that consistent just with the different types of scenes involved? That was the easy part. Uh, all you had to do was make it dark and rainy for most of the, most of the pages. You know, it was raining <laughs> on almost every page. I got so tired of inking rain. Um, and then down in the sewers uh, with Vermin, uh, just a lot of uh, rendering up the sewers. Um, so th that, that part was pretty simple. Uh, Mike kind of set the stage early on for what kind of stuff he wanted to see. Um, and I just kind of kept going with that. 
yeah, well, I mean, I guess when you guys were working on it, did you have any idea of the uh, longevity that that specific story would have and its, uh, you know, relation to kind of uh, suicide awareness? Well, I mean, it was certainly uh, dramatic to have a suicide in the storyline. And um, we knew that was something that was going to get some attention and maybe some media attention. Um, we knew it was going to uh, be a fan favorite uh, because um, we were all kind of at the top of our game, you know, Dematis and Mike and I were all doing what we thought was pretty good work. And um, Rick Parker, the letterer was doing some great stuff. So we were, we were very happy with the quality of it. And when you have good quality work, it's, it's usually going to um, make an impact, but we had no idea at all that it would still be, talked about about decades later and still be considered like w one of the best Spider-Man stories ever um, and everybody's uh, fan favorite. I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're all kind of um, still in shock that it's become the, uh, the hallmark that it has. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I would put that in uh man top spider-man storylines top five or even top three probably for me just because of the personal connection but uh yeah no that has become uh i mean not only one of the 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 definitive spider-man stories but is absolutely the most definitive craven the hunter story um so let me ask you was there uh, any specific like spider-man's rogue gallery villains that you uh enjoyed uh, working with or working on i should say well let me just point out i don't know if you know the story that uh the uh, the writer uh, mark dematis originally uh took that story to dc and dc rejected it he wanted to do it as a batman story and he was going to have, I think, Batman and the Joker, maybe. But he just approached them at the wrong time when uh, I think the Killing Joke was coming out or had just come out. And they thought it had too many maybe similarities with that. And so they turned him down. And so then he kind of reworked it and took it to Marvel as a Spider-Man story, but not with Craven. I think he had a different villain to start with. Um, and they weren't that crazy about it either and um he he just kind of uh it's a good story that you should get him to tell he knows the details a lot better than i do but he kind of then came upon craven and noticed that not much had been done with craven and he thought he could uh make a different uh put a different slant on craven and make him more interesting than he had been be before um which he obviously did um, so it, it kind of, that story just kind of took a long time to, to gel and to fall into place and become what it became. Um, and it just uh, is, is one of those things where it had to, be, had to, to come across at the right time to finally work. Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, that it reinvented the Craven character. It made the Craven character relevant again, because yeah. I mean, you know, there, there are Spider-Man villains that like come and go out of relevancy. Right. And Craven, you know, up until that point in my mind, he was always just kind of a throwaway villain. Right. He didn't have a lot of depth to him, but uh, you know, that, story in particular added a whole new level to that character. I mean, it almost made him more three-dimensional than anything else. Yeah, it was amazing. He, he really uh, did a great job with him. As far as other Spider-Man uh, villains, I don't know. Um, I've never been that fascinated with, with villains. Um, I thought the Sandman was a, kind of a fun villain to, to work with. Um, didn't like uh, Green Goblin, uh, particularly Vulture. Uh, I kind of like Doc Ock. He's always fun. Yeah, it seems like uh, with drawing the villains, you want a lot of options, right? You know, I mean, Sandman, he can pretty much manipulate himself into, you know, any kind of shape or uh, implement, right? And same with Doc Ock. Um, with those arms, you get the ability to like add different curves and designs and like, you know, really kind of fill up a lot of empty space on panels. So I could see why an artist would be more drawn to those characters. Yeah, the, the Vulture, Green Goblin, uh, 
I mean, Green Goblin's kind of interesting visually, um, but some of the other villains just just aren't that visually appealing. Uh, speaking as as a penciler, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And my my main interest in in comics is really just figure drawing. Um, I just like to draw people. Uh, it's not that I'm that big a, a fan of characters, certain individual characters. I mean, I like Spider-Man because, like you say, he gets in all these interesting poses that you can have a lot of fun with him visually. Um, uh, but I, I just basically like to draw people.